thank you for coming. Uh, I want to, uh, to thank you for coming. Make sure that you sign in so we have a record of, uh, of who came. My name is Sylvia Rodriguez, and I'm a commissioner on the Ezequiel de San Antonio in Valdez, and I represent that ditch on the board of the Taos Valley Ezequiel Association. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, have a talk, and if you haven't noticed, we have biscochitos and water. We have a great musician. Uh, Carlos, Dr. Ochoa will give his talk, and then we'll break for about 10 minutes and have question and answers and discussion about what he's going to talk about. Um, I want to thank Dr. Ochoa for coming, which he has done out of the goodness of his heart. Uh, not no longer working in New Mexico. He's on route to on route to Chihuahua, and very graciously agreed to stop and to talk to uh, to the uh, people on this river uh, about the research that he was engaged in. Uh, it was part of a larger project that ended a few years ago that looked at acequia systems as part of watersheds, and that study looked at El Rito Alcalde and also Rio Hondo. And uh, Carlos, or Dr. Ochoa, uh, oversaw a bunch of the technical parts of that, and uh, particularly on the Rio Hondo. Some of you may remember him because he's spoken to Parciantes about his, uh, his work in the past. Uh, and hopefully today we'll get more information about what the findings are. Um, I want to thank Craig Smith, uh, who is graciously providing music for us. Also, out of the goodness of his heart, we have a lot of good-hearted people who are helping us pull this together. Uh, this is part of a series of uh, meetings that the TVAA has conducted over the last uh, year uh, on each of the stream systems. And they are visitas, we call them, going into the communities to talk to Parcientes about their concerns as a way of helping us together uh, chart a direction that for the TVAA in the future. And in the future, uh, the, the needs of the ASACAS and the challenges that are going to be facing us are going to get even greater. And the role of the TVAA, I think, can be very important uh, to us. Um, so we started in the south and worked our way north, and this is the last one. And the format's a little different because we have research that's available on the Rio Hondo, and we also had the opportunity to ask Dr. Ochoa to talk to us. Uh, so the question and answer section, uh, I'll, I'm going to introduce things uh, after the break. Dean Archuleta, who is a commissioner on the Rivasse Ditch and also a member of the TVA board, uh, will facilitate the discussion part. Um, so uh, I would like, the, just to get started, uh, the members of the TVA board to stand and just introduce themselves, their name, and uh, what is that they're on. Just so you know, uh, you probably know most of them, but just, you know, and we'll start with Judy, who's actually the director of the TVAA. <laughs> she runs the office, and without her, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so, and of course, the, the others could stand. And, uh, uh, and also members of the l and &E Committee. Uh, the, the Leadership and Education Committee is a subgroup of the TVA that's actually organized these visitas. And uh, so some of them are board members and others are not. So uh, Olivia Gale, who's certainly a former board member, Oh, you want us to Just share. say your name and Gail yeah. Minton on the second Del Monte Del Rio Chiquito. <coughs> Olivia Romo with the New Mexico Asequia Association. I'm Del Martinez, chairman of the TA and member of the uh, Los Brandos Ditch on the Rio. Juanita Jaramillo Lavadi. I am a member of the Sanchez Ditch from the Rio Pueblo town. And I'm uh, Dean Archuleta, and I'm off the Mansa Ditch that irrigates off the Rio Hondo. Okay, well, um, we've got the title here. I met Carlos a number of years ago when we were on uh, uh, this research project where I was a consultant. Um, and he had, I guess, his, some of his doctoral work involved that study, and he knows a lot, and you guys know a lot, and uh, hopefully we'll have a productive discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, and thank you all for coming. Uh, really appreciate you guys giving the opportunity to come and talk to you guys, and so thanks for inviting me. 
to give this talk. It's a great pleasure to come back. And uh, Sylvia asked me about it if I wanted to come back and say yes. I'll, I'll love to try and fit it into whatever you got for me. And then when I was coming down here, I'm very grateful for uh, the support that you guys gave me when I was doing some of the work here. And uh, we've been kind of working behind the scenes with some of the students that are still or have had in the past collected data and we're running the analysis with that. So, uh, but beyond that, I really felt like this was a great, great opportunity for me to come back and, and, and uh, really uh, tell you in person how much I appreciate it I am from, for you guys giving the opportunity to work here in this, in this area. So in terms, of the, in terms of the talk, when Sylvia asked me to tell, him about, uh, tell you about this, I said, well, it's been five years since I left New Mexico, New Mexico State University, so I'm not up to date in all the uh, nuts and bolts in terms of the data collection and processing of these things, so I'm excusing ahead of my presentation and because you are not going to see the, the newest, shiniest data out there, <laughs> but hopefully that will put things in context for you guys to see some of the work we, we, we have done in the past and some of the ongoing work that is still happening as related to some of the data that has been analyzed by the, uh, some grad students as I said before. Thanks. So, uh, Mr. I mean, now I'm at Oregon State University. I'm an assistant professor there in the Animal and Rights and Sciences Department. So I do a lot of uh, all kinds of things related to surface water and groundwater interactions from agriculture, pretty similar to what we did here. But here we have 40 inches of precipitation, so a little, little bit different than uh, this part of the world. But here we have a lot of juniper, uh, big issue there in, in the Pacific Northwest, Western Juniper is a big deal. Removal of juniper that how that affect the whole hydrologic connections and things like that. Similar concept of the, the thing that we, we see here, but in a different landscape, this is a 14 inches precipitation zone. And then we have, I have a project which I still so mentioned I'm going to Chihuahua. Uh, we have another project in the Chihuahua, in the heart of the Chihuahua Desert, that has to see with the, with the Kale Ranch and some uh, soil water conservation practices that the, we have done there and how that affects the hydrology, the recharge of the aquifers and, and the sort of things. We do a lot of riparian related work, pretty much all of these involve integrated watershed or riparian systems management. And a lot of these systems resemble, particularly this resembles like to, in terms of the operation of the water, to use irrigation, water distribution, how that impacts the stream. Very similar to some of the things we we, we done here in New Mexico. And we're experimenting a lot with technology, so drones, we're using it quite a bit for a lot of this ecological and hydrological and cattle movement and wildlife and that sort of thing. That's, that's what I'm working on mostly. But also I work closely with uh, Steve Golden, that some of you might know from Ocali, and uh, with some of the students from San Fernando there in the New Mexico State, Las Cruces, to help them analyze some of the data that they collect from Rio Hondo and Enrico in Ocali. It's still part of the project that Sylvia mentioned ended already in terms of the funding, but the data gives, gives uh, giving some good, good information. So this is a project that Celia talked about. It was a CNH, a couple of natural and human systems. We, uh, Sylvia and the other uh, folks in the sociology, they did a great job in the human dimensions aspect of it. We focused mostly in the hydrology to help with this thing. So it was a great team effort that we did. Uh, so we have four years of projects in there, huh? Five years. Five years. So it was a great project, but that's what to an end. But uh, still, a lot of that thing is, is ongoing. So some of the, when we started this, this project, uh, well, we've been working on the Alcalde area for the last 15, 16, wow. 16 years or so. Yeah, 2002, we started there. And then, uh, so we've done, done a lot of work in that area. And from all that work, we started the hydrology kind of go into this other project and, and we ended up in a real humble in a region and keep doing a lot of work in our college still. Well, not up today, but in terms of the back in the day when we did this uh, integrated project. 
So Santa now was on the PI and this uh, the, the principal investigator in this uh, research project. Steve Golden, as you know, some of you know, is a superintendent of the Calder Science Center. Myself and Hydrogen and uh, several grad students out of New Mexico State have been uh, graduated and, and <coughs> providing some good uh, research out of there. So before, um, I want to, for some of you, this probably is going to be super basic, but I wanted to give a, like a, a primer in the, into the hydrology, some of the hydro 101. So excuse me, for, you already feel like you know these things. I also want to kind of tell you in the context of why this uh, knowledge is important with the data I'm going to present next. So I'm going to give you a few slides about how these things operate. So, uh, very much when we refer to surface water and groundwater relationships, so between storms and the snow melt periods, basically most of the water that ends in the stream is what we call the base flow. This is just groundwater, right? So there's no contributions from anything else. They use the groundwater, the, well, a lot of times we refer that to the, as the mountain block recharge. So basically what is stored in the mountain there as a block, and it kind of recharges or distributes back into the stream. So that's discharged into the stream. That's what we refer to as the base flow. So this is one way the the river gets its minimum of uh, its base flow condition, right? From there up, then we go into the storms and snow melt and irrigation contributions. <laughs> so the other thing is, you already have your base flow condition from the block recharge, and then when you irrigate or when you have snow melt going on, a lot of that moisture gets into the subsurface, right? Gets into the soil, into the what we call the basal zone, the unsaturated zone, and then eventually that area gets saturated, and kind of like gravity drains down into the stream. So. During these snow melt periods, in, in these flood irrigation systems like the acequias, we have a lot of contributions to the what we call subsurface flow, or also known as lateral flow. This water that goes into the stream. So that's a, it's a second way of uh, adding water to the stream. I don't think I have the slide for this one, but the other one is, particularly this time of the year, in the monsoon season, we have water that we call over land flow. Basically, these uh, big storms that we have, so a lot of water doesn't infiltrate into the soil and it runs over, we call it over land flow, and it gets into the stream. And you see them in pretty much all the arroyos around here. That is what we call over land flow. Right. So that is kind of hydro 101 in terms of how the hydrologic connections uh, interact in, uh, in, in regards to the landscape. And from there, we're going to start discussing some other important aspects related to uh, our understanding of the top, I mean, of the real under area. So, well, here's the other one. Actually, I had it after all. <laughs> anyway, so here it is. Basically, uh, this is overland flow. This is what we call excess saturation or excess infiltration. So, there's two, two ways of, of, of saying it, right? Excess infiltration is when uh, it's high intensity precipitation events. It rains a lot, very fast, so there's not enough time for the water to infiltrate. So the kind of excess infiltration doesn't infiltrate. The other thing is, is when we have what is called excess saturation, that happens mostly around October when we have uh, kind of a frontal storm systems, but the soils are getting wetter and wetter and wetter, and then we have some rain. And then it's already saturated, so there's not enough room for the water to infiltrate anymore. So that, that's what we call excess saturation. So and then the water kind of runs over the soil. So that's an entire overland flow. All right. This is schematic, it's very important, and it's very um, uh, applicable to the conditions here in the Rio Hondo. And bear with me in some of these things, I'm going to try and, and, and explain it to the best of my knowledge here. So, 
normally in these systems, imagine kind of this key area there where you have a bunch of pine trees. So this is what we call the recharge zone for the most part. We have forests, and within that forest we can have fractured basalt or any kind of fracture in, in, the, in, the, in the limestone or any, any of the formations there. So a lot of those, all the rocks are not like impermeable rocks, they, they are fractured. This is where the water recharges to that. And kind of follow these paths and eventually ends up, ends up either in the stream, and that's in, in the aquifer for sure. And you can pump it with your domestic wells, is what you do, you kind of pump the water out of the aquifer. But the actual water comes from the mountains for the most part. So that's one way to the fractures. A lot of times you have also like in caves. I don't know, around here I'm not really familiar with any cave that holds water and drinks around here, but there are some other places mostly in the, the kind of desert area where you have a lot of caves and those kind of drain into the aquifer. The sinkholes also. This is more like for a different formation, more like karst, like karst formation. But all these things come, come in here and eventually either go to the stream as a spring, so a lot of springs around here, right? So this is one route that follows the spring, and the other one is directed to the stream, kind of drains a subsurface flow to the stream. What is unique to the Talos area is this, the geological falls that you guys have here. So a lot of the geology of this area is very unique. So a lot of, uh, it was, it was a big fight millions of years ago in terms of how the geology formed around here and how the forces of the geology kind of interacted and pushed against each other. And you see at the top of one of those rocks how they are twisted, right? Because they were kind of pushing with tremendous force and they were kind of breaking some of the rocks and pushing some others. So that's why you have a very complicated geology in, in this area here. You know, along with that you have these geologic folds you might have heard the Dunn Fault, which is the gorge. Basically, that's just a fault. You might have heard the Airport Fault, right? That's another one kind of close uh, past Romeo Hondo before you get to the to the Rio Grande. It's another fault, and there is one of the Piedmont of the of the, of the uh, rock recharge there, right in in, uh, in Valdez, where the Valdez starts, right there. It's another big fault. So you have these three three big faults, and faults have the condition of directing the groundwater to different elevations that you can see. We can, we can go like this and kind of recharge, but we can go to the next level, the next level. We can reach another deeper aquifer later on. It really depends on how the faults are uh, uh, constructed, right? So we have what we call the recharge zone, all those things, and then the discharge zone, where we extract the water. So this is uh, almost impossible for you guys to read. I cannot really see it from here. But uh, I'm going to try to describe as much. See, look, this is this is uh, Valdez and starts around here, and this is uh, the block recharge. So those all these igneous rocks right there. So this big volcanic uh, mass of rocks right there, and then you have the alluvium, the alluvial system here, uh, kind of fanning into the rest of the landscape. And with that, this is, this is one of the faults that I was mentioning, the one right, right above all this. And then here's the other one, the airport one, and here's the one by the gorge, right there, right in the Rio Grande. So this is if you consider the entire, the entire uh, range from Valdez all the way down to Rio Grande. What is important out of these geological features is that you have uh, three main geological characteristics that you deal with here and kind of interacts with all your acequias and all the recharge, discharge of your wells and things like that. And that has, it's a shallow aquifer system that you have. Uh, you can see the lines around here. So kind of from, uh, from Rio Hondo coming in this direction, from down here. So you have, this is a shallow aquifer. On the other side, you have the Cerro Negro, which is another igneous type of rock. So this is almost like an impermeable rock on top, and it's very fractured at the bottom. So it has a lot of 
a lot of flow in the deep aquifer, in the deep volcanic aquifer, but not in the shallow aquifer. So most of your acequia uh, flow interactions, <coughs> at least for the short run, are going to have to see with the shallow aquifer. That doesn't mean that some of that water may end up in the deeper aquifer, right? But that take uh, way longer than just a few days or months. And then another thing that you have here is what we call these perch water table systems. So these are just rock formations, impermeable rock formations, so the water doesn't penetrate all the way down, it kind of drains out as the springs. So all these springs that you have here are because you have these perch water tables. So that's that's a lot of that in here. And that's again also that big fight of the, the volcanics when this happened, all this interaction of the rocks and mixing and, and, and hitting against each other. Some of these solid slabs, imagine solid slabs, kind of stay there and first, first the water table system. So if you drill a well there up in the hills, sometimes you get lucky and get to one of these systems and get water. But you can go 50 feet from there and then you go into the deeper aquifer and you have to go 300 feet or more to extract any water there. Sometimes you get it in 20 or 50 feet if you have a perch water system, but you go to the edge of this here and you miss it. So that's, that's a lot of the things going on. This is for your housing development, for uh, all this, and this doesn't have to be much for the Asequias. Nonetheless, provides a lot of influence to the river, recharge and discharge of the river. This is what we call the Oh, we'll talk about this later here. I don't want to anticipate. So, what's the next please? All right, so you can tell me what it says here, and you guys are experts in hydrology. <laughs> but this is, uh, and I'm, I'm signing this paper by Peggy Johnson and then uh, Marcos, uh, this guy's the geohydrology of this area. They are the experts in geohydrology. They did a pretty good understanding of it. I'm kind of putting this in the context of how these things help us understand the hydrology of the sink. Okay? There's not a, it's not a crash course in hydrogeology by no means. But here is the thing I was telling you about. This is the water table. The blue line is the water table. This is the depth from the surface down to the to the water table. So where you have the airborne fault, remember I was telling you this is right below Arroyo Hondo. Then you have this big fault, and then the water table drops around 300, 350 feet right there. So imagine you have the water going like that, and all of a sudden it's like shush, a huge waterfall down there, 300 feet. And then the water kind of keeps draining into the next fault, which is the gorge right here, and then kind of drains out into the Rio Grande. So that's why when, when a lot of the, the, the hydrologists, when they start looking at, okay, what my water level table and things like that, you get to the fault and it's a mess because you know you don't know if the fault is going to be a conduit like in this case or a barrier in other cases. It also can act as a barrier depending on how the fault is slipping up or down or to the side or to the right or the left. It might direct the water in different directions. In this case is uh, cascading it down, so it's an easy one. So. So could you show us on that map if you can where the Valdez fault is? No, the Valdez fault is not here. This is mostly this is just a Royal right Hondo Park. Oh, okay. So, so uh, you have to go like almost around here. Yes. This 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 is the work from Peggy Johnson. They did it mostly in the Royal Hondo area. Nonetheless, in the previous map I showed you where they illustrate the other one. Uh, this yellow thing here, by the way, this is a, the, a, the shallow aquifer. So here's where your secchias interact with. So anything, all, all the moisture you see in your soils and even that is at this level. And then you have the recharge zone, which is this one here. So really your secchia systems are interacting mostly with this area here, the unsaturated, or what we call the unconfined aquifer. Okay, next. So here's some illustration that about the perch water systems. So basically this is the thing I was telling you, you have this, we call this apiclue. This is like a semi-permeable formation. It can be very heavy clay or some sort of rock formation that kind of prevents for the water to drain 
not easily. And what it does, not more variable, what it does, it kind of drains to, drains to the side, and then eventually you get those springs. So anywhere you see a spring, you're going to have an output kind of right under it. Right. Uh, well, it's not here, but below this thing, below the actor, we, we have what we call the output tar with a, a T A R D output tar, which is basically almost, almost impermeable. It's like the bare rock right there. That's it's not. There's no such thing as impermeable when we talk about hydrology, but a lot of times geologists in particular talk about semi-permeable or impermeable, but there's no such thing as that. It's not like a paved road or anything like that. So you still have a little bit of water going through, but it's just a uh, very slow process. This is the thing I was telling about the well. If you drill your well up here, you can lock it so you get water, you go to the other side of the house, and then you go to the very deep aquifer. You have to pay way more to the to the drinker. Anyway, so there's a lot of that here in Rio Hondo. So that's what I'm saying. And I don't think this has been studied a lot. Not even us, I don't think we studied it at all. And these are huge implications to Rio Hondo flow, right? And to your sectors and how they, they interact. Next, please. So another thing uh, that has important implications here is the extent of your floodplain. This is your floodplain. Imagine you are here in the Arroyo Hondo. It's a, big, it's a, it's a wider floodplain versus Valdez, which is a, a narrower floodplain, right? So you still have interaction coming from, this is the, the groundwater flow coming from the mountains, but also every time you irrigate or you have a big storm, you have sort of like a local, like a sponge capturing water and kind of draining back into the river. So the bigger the water your flow plan is, depending on the soil you have, the, the better uh, temporary reservoir underground you might have. It really depends on the conditions and how <coughs> you apply water. So if you go to parts of the Western US and talk about flood irrigation, people almost get a heart attack about it, right? For you guys here, some of you have been doing this through hundreds of years. This is a, this is a, 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 a no brainer that you really need to put water, flow of water on the system to, to keep your wells up and running, to drain pollutants, all these things. So flood irrigation has a lot of environmental benefits that are not normally uh, perceived as such. But in this, in this particular case, this, uh, uh, it has been proven. So depending on the flood plane, like I was saying, has huge interaction with the, with the, with the shallow or not. The worst case scenario is when your flood plane misses communication with the river. So which, that happens sometimes. That has happened like in, in southern New Mexico, actually, when they got rid of the acequias there, like in the Socorro area, uh, there was not more flood irrigation. Then it started going into some of the drain, and I think that's all, started uh, growing some salts. I think that's the soil is becoming fertile. They didn't put enough water, so the, the, the soil didn't get recharged and eventually lost the connection with that. That's happening a lot in. Uh, Las Cruces and the Mesilla Valley, El Paso. A lot of other pumping there from the city of El Paso and, and Juarez. Uh, and the, what's it called, the Bolson, right? The, one of the big aquifers there. Uh, so they're getting disconnected. The river ground is no longer connected with the deeper aquifer. And it's, it's, it's a big deal. Once you lose the connection there, that is a, it's a big problem. You know, something you can restore. Anyway, so let's the next. So this thing of gating or losing conditions. How many of you have heard that terminology? Good. So several of you. All right. So here's the thing with gating or losing conditions. Normally we refer to that as a gaining stream is when we said the stream gains from the aquifer, right? So the aquifer is draining into the stream. Losing condition is the opposite. The stream is losing water to the aquifer. Right. In any given river, 
you can find regions where you have losing organic conditions depending on the local geology and the local management and the season, the time of the year. So you can have organic condition now and at the end of the year can be a losing condition depending on a lot of those things. Uh, so don't get tricked into it. It's always going to be losing or gaining. It might be some regions that, yes, they can stay like that for, 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 for forever. Uh, but for the most part, can be to have sections that are not recharged. Now, why is important here is when you have a losing stream, so here's your, your crops, here's your Yosecki, imagine right next to it, and you're, you're losing the water from, this, from the river, from Rio Hondo to the aquifer. So that means whatever water is coming from your from your fields is not going to make it to the stream. It's going to follow the aquifer rather. So it's really going somewhere else. It's not maintaining that connectivity that I'm talking about that you need to have. So under most circumstances, you want to have a gaining condition as much as you can. Right? But like I said, a natural condition, you cannot be the gainer or losing. But you have the opportunity to manage your water resources you want to have a gaining condition. Most of the secures, so these are the ones in Alcalde that we uh, studied, they are gaining, uh, gaining systems. The ones that we have here, we're looking into that data actually now. I think most of them are, are uh, this, the stream is gaining from the secures per plate pool, but uh, it really, I, I don't have a definite answer to that yet. This guy, Dracos at all, did a one-time measurement in January of 2000, I believe, and, he, and they concluded that the lower Rio Hondo Ridge, that means from Cainocitos to Rio Grande, is a, it's a gaining stream. So that means there was no, no irrigation right in, in the winter. So there was no water at the end of the stream, so there, therefore they concluded that that section of the river is a gaining condition, and they concluded that upstream that from Cainocitos up to Valdez, that's a uh, losing ridge. They have less water at the end than uh, at, at, the, at the top. So less water downstream and upstream, so that's a, a losing condition. This is one of the methods. We call this inflow outflow test to determine if it's a gaining or a losing condition. The other method that I show you kind of is like with the wells data. Remember the way I show you the fault in the water table? You can also determine if it's a gain or losing condition. But when you have a big fault like that, it's almost like nothing you can do with it to call it a gain or a losing because it's, it's, it's not fair to compare with uh, some of you compare apples to oranges. Right? So that's why this method is more universally accepted. So you measure upstream, measure downstream. You have more water downstream, that means your ratio is gaining. You have less water downstream, that means your ratio is losing. Okay. Okay. So uh, that is super important in terms of the gaining and losing conditions because we are dealing, for the most part, what we call the unconfined aquifer. This is your shallow, we refer to this as the shallow aquifer. It can, uh, when we say shallow, for this part it can be 30 to I mean, 300 feet or so, it's kind of shallow. But if you are in, in the south part of the state, probably shallow means like a thousand feet, right? So right in the heart of the Chihuahua Desert. So it really depends. But here, shallow, the one that we have studied most is typically less than 30 feet. So that's a shallow, uh, unconfined aquifer. Then you have these confined clays, or confined beds. Can be, for the most part, it's clays uh, or some sort of rocks. And some of those aquifers, when you top, when you pump a well, normally, unless it's your domestic and all you use for cattle or something like that, you you don't want to go into the into the unconfined aquifer because that's the aquifer that is more subject to anything that, that you do in the soil. If you, by any chance, put fertilizer, pesticides, and like that, some of that is going to drain into, into this aquifer. So you want to keep it as clean as possible. 
If you're using this for drinking the water, the recommendation is go to the next level or the, uh, the, uh, the second level so you have more, more water to start with because you have in a confinement layer and then it's uh, cleaner water. So that's more like the more uh, the mutual domestic and any other deeper wells going to the second or the third aquifer for the most part. So the interactions and how this, this thing happens is also very important. If you irrigate here, normally you're going to see, at least in these uh, secular systems, in Rio Hondo and Alcalde, the system we, we studied, in matters of hours to days. No more than that, you're going to see some of the water reaching the aquifer. So, in some other cases, this is natural precipitation. It can take months or years, but that's not very common for the unconfined aquifer, at least not in northern New Mexico. However, if you are taking the water out of the second or the third aquifer, you're drinking water that is hundreds of years old or thousands of years old. And this is a big problem in the cities. Because water is a non-renewable non source, right? People tend to think of well, it's renewable because it kind of goes up to the atmosphere and comes back. Yeah, but normally not in the generation time, which is what we consider renewable. So it takes forever, because thousands of years. So imagine 1,000 years from now on to recharge that the aquifer that you're depleting now. So it's a big deal. So that's why it's, 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 a, it's a problem in this, I mean, all over the world, not, not just here. So depleting aquifers is, is, is a problem. So you need to do it in a consistent uh, and uh, sustainable way. You need, that's why you need to understand your entire hydrologic system from the top down to, to, the, to the bedrock. And down to the sides and from the apples. So it has to be a whole holistic or systems understanding of the, the system you're dealing with. And next slide. So uh, in the case of this uh, second systems here, we, we normally gonna be dealing with the unconfined aquifer. It's gonna cut that out of there. And this is part of the, this is the figure that came from that project when we um, define what is the prayer we wanted to do. And here you can see irrigation and after recharge, that is because all this uh, irrigation going on with the, with the acequias. So we wanted to measure what was the impact on the groundwater. If we have any recharge or not, and it was seasonal or it was just one time a year, what was the deal? So we didn't know when we started the project. So in 2002, 2001, 2002, when we started that project, Sam, and Steve told them there, uh, they, they talked some of the in the county area and, and they in and some waters, see different parts of the state and they were talking, well, there's, we see all these recharge from our wells and all these things and it was a big deal from the, I don't know what agency, the state government was providing funding for lining the ditches there and it was like this local wisdom was saying, well, wait a minute, if we, plan out the ditch, what's going to happen to our wells, right? And, uh, and uh, so the, the guy from the government said, well, it's not a big deal. All you need to do is put move water from here to there, and that'll make, make things very efficient. Say, so, well, no, let's, let's wait. They kind of reached out to Sam and Steve, and I joined the team. And uh, we started looking into the things they told us that they had already seen, but then there was no data to validate any of that. So that was the thing. So like I said, yeah, we can tell anything we want, but uh, interesting. the state and industry commission, they're going to say, no, thanks. So you need to show us what is there. So that's what triggered the project 15, 16 years ago, and here we are still trying to document some of those things that many of you guys already know from generations, right? But uh, we're trying to do, provide the data and go beyond that and kind of see, okay, how is this connected to the to the uplands and what happens to the riparian habitats and all the, the community, as the communities grow, program development, how is that going to impact things? Just exponential growth. Anywhere in the West you go, or anywhere in the world you go these days, has grown exponential in the last 30, 50 years. So it's a lot more people, more water needs. It has to be a, a, a different way of 
allocate them water for everybody. Mm -hmm. And now by different, I don't mean totally changing the rules or anything, I think when I used to be comments on the water, the things that are happening, all these, inter these relationships are there, so you guys can take the most and best informed decision. You have a question? No? Alright. I'm oh, sorry. Some of this you can see, because in Upper Hondo, um, the, uh, where we flood, you know, the pastures when there's water, it, it doesn't have springs. Lower Hondo, when you get down before you get to the, uh, the upshot of the land, you can see it because there's springs all over the place and the river has more water in it. We don't have much in Upper Hondo, and then they'll have a bunch in Lower Hondo. And you can also see the alluvial flows if you go over the mesa, you know, and you're looking towards the north, you can see the alluvial flows that go down into Valdez. So they're going to get water, but it's like that centerpiece that has some problems that we need to put water into the cropland so it'll sink in and we have water. Yes. Well, those are the management decisions that you guys need to take, but uh, and you, you need to understand these this things where they're coming from, and you need to quantify the things as much as possible, yeah. right? So you know what you're dealing with. Because a lot of times you assume, uh, particularly engineers assume that you don't have any water to start with, and you already have a lot of sea fishes and a lot, a lot of spring, that you already have a base flood condition. So that probably means that you don't need that much extra water to push the water to the system. Or some other cases, depending on the on the slope of the ditch or anything like that, you really need a lot of water to push it to the system because the ditch is this is permanent enough that allows a lot of seepage. So you need to put more pressure to it to kind of keep it going. That doesn't mean the ditch is inefficient or anything like that. It's just it's just because of the geology and the soils that you're dealing with are are different, and you need to account for those things. So what I'm saying is you kind of do it case by case, you cannot pretend that because you know X amount of water at, at the gate, it has to be the same amount of water at the end of the ditch. A lot of that is going to be sipping, and that doesn't mean that it's lost. That is just water that is kind of helping mitigate <laughs> other things. Anyway, so let's jump into some of the data. So here is, oops, from 19, what is it, 34, up until today, or your, this is the real Honda near Valdez USGS station. The red line represents the average stream flow conditions through the HCFS per day. This is the, the average throughout this entire year. Right, so this, there are some years where you have, most of the years you have pretty good, good flows. There are some years, you can see this one here, I think it's 2002. Back in the 60s, some, some years they were pretty bad, but for the most part, they've been okay for since 38 up until now. I'm sorry about the quality of the presentation here, but it's supposed to turn out nicely. Uh, so let's go to a closer look at some of this. This is 2016 up until today. So I, I wanted to give you two years here, or almost two years. This is last year, basically this is, this is uh, water year 2017, this is water year 2018. This is what you guys are dealing with now. So you have uh, your water year starts here on October 1st. You have kind of broadly average, a little bit of winter, snowpack, kind of came and went like you guys didn't even notice probably. And then here you are, very, very low, right? So, this modern nature, I don't know what, what to do with it, other than you guys need to understand that, uh, I mean, you understand very well, you deal with these things every day, but these are, these are years that are going to happen, and the thing where the, the things are changing with the climate and things like that, things are getting more often like this, so, like anything else, we need to adapt for those things. That's not the, the worst year so far in the last, this is 2002, right here. Now I kind of wanted to also 2003 here. So this is below average the entire year. At least in the other one, you have some spikes here and there. So here starts your, your year, what year, up to here. So it was like 2002. I wasn't here, but I bet some of you were here and kind of experienced that back then. 
that was, in terms of that, that was even worse. However, you got a nice previous year that wasn't, that wasn't bad, and then you have an okay following year. It wasn't the best, but it was, but then you have some moisture, right? So the hope is that for this year, we can go back to the previous one, please. So as you've been noticing, so some of this is probably from these rains that you've been having, so actually here, but it's still not enough to get it even up to, to the average condition. So you really have to get more of these uh, monsoon storms to really have this, this uh, minimum or this uh, mean average, I mean conditions are. So hopefully the monsoon turns out good for you guys, and then you have a good winter uh, after that. But then that is going to be pretty close to 2002 for next year. So I hope not. All right, next, please. Okay. So in terms of irrigation and uh, uh, conditions, uh, back in 2013 and 2014, uh, we, I wasn't already here, but some of the guys collect some of this information at four sites along the Rio Hondo. The upstream means the gauging station there, the USGS gauging station, Pascal Dex. The downside is the old Bio Rec, right before Cainocitos, or the geologists call that the gates of Valdez, because that kind of looks like a gate, a big geological gate. Uh, this is another modern station, Naturally Mills, below, and then this is the old USG station past Arreondo. Right, so these are the four stations where they collect the data. This is during the irrigation season, you can see the dates from May up until August, May of 2013 up until August, are selected days. They have more data, but I, I, I kind of show those to not have a very big table. You can see that all cases during the irrigation season, you have more water at the upstream than at the downstream, right? right. And that is because you are pretty much starting with a lot of water and then you kind of send it into the different acequias and this is the, the typical thing that you will see. Because you are distributing the water out there to the landscape. Hopefully some of that water comes back later in the year as we're, through, we're talking about springs and, and other things. So, next, next please. These are some measurements that I took back in 2009 and 2010. I didn't have the trolling mill site then, but only did a couple of years for a couple of months for the downside. But you can see this is the off irrigation season. This is in the winter, and you can see the opposite, right? So you have return flow, you have more water at the downstream in the winter, so that means all that return flow that you guys put there to the irrigation is coming back and meeting at the end of the, the season. Back in, in December through February, I think I uh, had another one in April that was already kind of like uh, almost the same because it was about the, about the irrigation started again. Okay? And uh, the interesting here, interesting stuff here is, at the downside, we had the same condition. Remember I told you when Dracos did their, their work, they concluded that this, were, this was gaining and this was losing. This is from, from the station, from the USGS to Cainocitos, and they had a losing condition here. In this case, we have a gaining condition. So that means, you guys that irrigate in the Valdez area, you're still getting some recharge right here around the kind of citrus and around the downside in the winter time. You guys that irrigate past that for the trolling mill down, you, you also get some return flow even more down at the at the Luster Rear Ground, right? At, at the old GOGS station. So that means you have a gaining stream condition throughout the entire range from Valdez down to uh, Rio Grande. So this is different from the findings supported by, by our papers. So this is this portion here. Of course, uh, it's always, you see two days here, well, four days total, and you say, well, where's the rest of the data, and you want to have more data, things like that. That's all we have for now. If there's an interest on some of this, this needs to be documented some more. 
But up until now, I can tell you, just based on this, and you know in other systems that we have dealt with, that this is what you expect. And this is just gravity, right? So start from the top, kind of drains down, distribute the water on the float plane, eventually drains down downstream. Then you got like a little pool there in Cayon Citus, and then it starts again in the, in the trolley, and then have another pool down there. So same, same concept. Okay, any questions up to there? Because I'm running out of saliva. <laughs> nope. Anybody have a little sleep yet? <laughs> yes. So, if you have water flowing through your ditches, but then you know, some of your ditches are deprived of getting water to them, what is the impact on that? Because there are certain ditches that uh, there isn't sufficient water, or well, it's claimed that there isn't sufficient water, and the water doesn't reach quite a number area of water at all. It doesn't get any water, which would be recharging the, the, the ground. Yeah, that goes back to the distribution of the water. It really depends on like, anything else, depending on how much water you have to play with, and how you well okay. Right, so even uh, in a dry year, like this year, uh, whatever the agreement you guys go by, that's what it stays in place. Uh, through generations, it's been certain ways. I've been, it, it used to be like it, it was the same amount of water for everybody, regardless if it was a dry or a, a wet year. Uh, some of those conditions no longer apply for many places, not just around here. It's, it's the same, because like I was saying, the demands are different these days. Nonetheless, in the end, it's about how do you make the best use of the water you have to work with. So, there is not a, a straight answer for that. I mean, I, I don't have an answer to tell you. I mean, in an ideal condition, yes, you want to have water in all the ditches. Yes, you want to have all the ditches running and keeping the, the connections and the recharge and all these things. Then in totality, okay. Now you don't have enough water to really distribute among all the ditches. So how do I work out among the communities to distribute the water in a way that keeps maintain this sort of uh, uh, what we call it wet flows. That means the connections going. So I don't think that answers your question, but it's really not a straight answer for something like that. Because I I don't have one. If I have the power to say yes, open the gate out of the dam, send more water, but we don't have a dam to start with, so that's the problem. <laughs> yes? During this trip, did you have any problems with water coming through the Tulski Valley to see what they're doing to the ditches, uh, to the river, to rebuild the water? I, I didn't have an opportunity to go there. I'm aware of some things going on there. Uh, and that is, yeah, it hasn't in the, the last two, three years is a, big, is a big deal, but it's not something new to. But the ski valley has always been, inside the hand waters, they, they have a big impact, and they are doing development. So they can provide water by melting all that snow faster, or they can retain water and redistribute the water. But the thing is, as long as they maintain some control on the headwaters that's going to have an impact on any community downstream. And that is just here in anywhere else in the world. So, um, yeah, so. Well, I don't think the commissioners have been notified really of the changes. I had the opportunity to go and see what they're doing up at the ski area. I understand that it's the Forest Service that approved what they're doing. Yeah, and that's, I mean, uh, that goes above my pay grade, really. I don't, <laughs> I don't have an answer for those things, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm totally sympathetic and I understand um, the situation. And uh, a lot of times what they do, they kind of don't recognize the community needs and they go on to negotiate with the feds and they go through an agreement and, and the community gets, gets the hit, right? Uh, so, like anything else, I mean, from my perspective, all I can say is 
try to negotiate as much as you can, reach, reach an agreement as much as you can. Uh, but I'm an outsider. I'm looking from a different perspective. I don't, I, I, I don't know, really. I mean, no. I wish I could help you more. You're not, you're not an outsider because you've been here and studied the problems for several years. And so you have a pretty good idea what's going on. Well, what, what we're trying to do is, like, uh, move through this research and this. this Having this kind of conversation is giving you the information that we have to the best of our understanding of how the hydrology in the geology and the land use interacts. But it's not up, up to us to need any recommendation for you guys to go in this direction or that direction. We provide you with the information and you guys decide what to do with it. Because the moment we, we lean one side or the other, then we lose our objectivity as, as researchers in, in this thing. So we're a third entity, we have, we have to keep the science straight as much as we can, and, and you guys are the ones who decide what to do. So the county needs to look at what they're doing up there because then they take the agricultural exemption from, uh, from the farmers because they can't irrigate their lands because they're not getting enough water. I guess, I guess all I can say, again, from, from what we do is information is power. So here's a big piece of information that, that through this research we're providing everybody, you guys and everybody, everybody in the public has, can have access to this information. And uh, use it to the best of your knowledge and ability to, to, to present the facts and say, well, here's the thing that we've we seen, this is what we expect to do. We can we can do some expert opinion of some sort, but uh, again, uh, beyond that, is is all this information on the internet? Uh, some of it is in, in the internet. Um, well, there's all this is the previous stuff of this is just uh, conceptual that I that I gave you. Most of the data I share with you guys when I was collecting the data. I was here every, I see someone there in the back. I was here like at least once or twice a year for this kind of, well not exactly this kind of meeting, but at least one meeting where I provide you all the information and some of you ask for the data, we kind of give you all the data we have back then. So, and then a lot of this information has been turned into publications, kind of scientific peer review publications, so a lot of this data is available that way. And a lot of times the agencies is the, the way they, they recognize data, so they don't want to see like uh, uh, documents that are not peer-reviewed in scientific literature. So that's why a lot of times you're better off you rely on our publications. If we have a series of, uh, I don't know how many publications from the Alcalde, eight to ten peer-reviewed publications easily from Rio Hondo, was two maybe, Three uh, here in the next three or four in the next month. So all these data is somehow going to be presented there, so you guys can take it out there. Now the thing is, uh, we're trying to do here with these meetings. Uh, I was telling Sylvia. I, I mean, I, I really love these meetings because that helps me unpack those journal articles. But sometimes we have to go very technical for for, for them to approve it for publication. So what I'm trying to do here is, okay, here's all this information. This Let's bring it to the where you and I can have a uh, a conversation and learn. I'll learn from your needs, and then I kind of give some feedback to the publication. So, yes, sir. Right. The data at the Ski Valley has been published by Paul Dracos with Glorietta. It's in the New Mexico Geologic Society Spring Meeting this year abstracts, which are available to the public. No, a lot of that is there, and some of the uh, data that I've sent or some of the information from Peggy Johnson and, and Rocco Sars, yeah, those are available to the geology, yeah, sorry. Part of the difficulty is that when Ski Valley did something, for example, when they put in their new uh, sewer system, they had an impact, they looked at an impact statement, but only with the Forest Service, which was not impacted like we are down here the same way with the water usage. And so somehow 
the communities here have to get together and demand that we also have an impact. And we're more impacted than Ski Valley. Right. Exactly. And you, you guys are doing the right thing by coming this man and, and having a, a better handle without information. Sorry. You may or may not know that they're planning to drill 2,000 foot wells, mitigation wells in Royal Hondo. And I'm really curious to know what impact that's going to have on the groundwater and on people's wells and on the community well. That's a, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't have a, we haven't studied that, that part. Uh, it would really require for us to do another more technical study to go into the deeper aquifer system and things like that and really look into the pumping rates and whatever the size of the aquifer is. Uh, these consultants like Drax and all of these guys, that's what they do. Uh, so they have good estimates, I assume. For some of that, uh, so that some of that information is available there. But again, not in our case, we haven't done that, so I don't have an answer for that. Is, is it going to have an impact? It may have an impact. It ha I mean, it will have an impact, right? Right. right. How, how significant that impact will be? That's uh, the, the and how you can help ameliorate some of those impacts by having a, a, a nicer, or a, a nicer. Uh, a distribution system like the one you have that is kind of keeps and maintaining the, the local shallow aquifers recharge all the time, mm -hmm. but at the same time some of our water, and this is the part that we need to understand better that we don't know, how the shallow aquifer is connected to the deeper aquifers. Would you be extracting water from the deeper aquifers, but maybe, potentially, as I was saying about the faults and all these things, mm -hmm. you also might have some recharge from the irrigation that might end up there. So how significant that is and how how that kind of actor uh, help mitigate some of the pumping. So those are the things that I don't think uh, the geohydrologists have yet, and we certainly don't have. So a lot of times the level of hydrology we do, that's what's called surface water, groundwater. For these geohydrologists, like these consultant firms, they go to the deeper geological system. The system that you guys are dealing with, the shallow, the unsaturated system, they, can, they don't even consider it, to tell you the truth. So they, that is just a, a, a tiny portion on their, on their map there, uh, because that's not a, a burning water system for them. So they go into the confined aquifer because this is the way they can extract water. Remember I was telling you about these confining layers and why they even have that kind of water. So that's why they don't pay attention to the other one. Now, what we're trying to do with these studies is kind of, kind of bridge that information from, okay, this is very important for the communities, but also the, the, the pumping and the groundwater depletion is also very important for the communities, because yes, on one hand, you need to have water for the community's uh, supply, on the other hand, okay, at, at what cost are you going to do that? And what is the, the, the common ground on that? But, I mean, not all the time, and for the most part, depending on the aquifers you see you're dealing with, most of those aquifers are very productive and they can <coughs> last very long. So it's not like all of a sudden you're gonna, you know, run out of water and you're in ditch or something like that. Normally they go to the very deep, deep systems. Again, if there's, if there's always an, uh, a potential that something got screwed up in, in the process, right? But. I mean, they do it in all the cities. They do it in Albuquerque, in Santa Fe, in El Paso, in Denver, whatever. So, like I said, the more people you have living in a community, the more needs you're going to have regardless. So that's, that's life. So, sorry, what's another? Yes, all. Uh, I'm especially interested in the data that you and the other researchers have collected on the Asequia flows. And we've gotten some of that from you in the past but how is it possible to get the complete set of data for all the years? Could you speak up, Saul? On Ezekiel flows? Uh, I'm asking Carlos if it's if we can access the data that they've collected on the Ezekiel flows uh, throughout all the years that they were doing that. I... Yes, they have a... That is available by... Um, 
on the USGS side where the Water Resources Research Institute side? Or maybe the Inner Spring Commission side? I don't think that's, so you're talking about the, this, this floor, right? From this, this, this yeah, the the floors, I know that um, you did a lot of uh, manual measurements on the different acequias, and then also for a while you had the SDRs, which are in those boxes, uh, operating, and we got very little of that data. I don't know if it's still stored on those, um, or who has it. We would like to have that. Yes, um, right, so I can, I can respond to the time I was here in terms of the data and I gave you guys whatever I had before I left. Uh, I, can, I can ask Sam and his students for work in the rest of the day. I know they stopped collecting some of that data back in 2015 probably. Now they... They have two set up. Alejandro came out this year and set up the Atalaya and uh, San Antonio. Those are the only ones operating right now, and I don't know if he's ever coming back or he told me he was planning his field season and he would be back, and then I never heard from him again. Yeah, that's uh, and I apologize for that, even though I am no longer part of it. And it was your system, but it's, um, I'll talk to Sam to see what is that I can get from them to direct it to you guys. Then you have the same issue with the wells that we were discussing with Tom. Um, so that's my commitment to all of you guys. Reach out to see what, what data is out there. Like I said, I've been helping with some of the data analysis. Not all of this data. I know there is some data out there. Once I, I talk to the students and they're okay, I can provide you that information. Uh, and, and that means some also. But other than that, I, that's just all I can do. I wish I was more directly involved, like I was in the past. Yeah, well, we can talk to some of those other people, but that's really important to, uh, to me and to other people as well. Uh, to have that. that, that was one of the things that uh, we had hoped to have all along, actually. Yeah. For, for, we've had these measuring flumes and the SDR recorders installed for 12 years now, and we've gotten very little useful data out of that, um, partly because the installation was never completed correctly, and uh, you helped us get the SDR set up, but uh, now they're decommissioned again, and nobody has ever been trained on how to use them, or how to collect the data, or how to set them up. And also, the locks on the boxes, at one point they were changed, now they're gone, and we don't know where they are, or who has them, or why they were removed, and we'd like to get them back. Good. Uh, like I said, I, I, can, I can follow up with that if, if it's something I can help with from my new role now that I, 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 I'm more than happy to help you guys with setting things up and, you know, train where we need to be trained to do the data collection that sort of thing. That's from my personal commitment, but I cannot speak for it for other parts of the institution or that institution anymore, right? Okay. So, but we can talk about that and you guys are interested we can, I can, I'm more than happy to help you. And like I said at the beginning, I'm really grateful and I'm here to help as much as I can. Sorry. What is uh, the impact on uh, redirecting, let's say, springs through the union plan? The, how much impact does it have in a white water to private for the mainstream? Uh, for springs? Yeah. Redirecting the springs? Redirecting the spring to benefit a certain part, which is the Skid Alley is doing, and and it's not reaching us. Either they drill the mitigating well down up there that's retaining water, or it's not flowing. Yeah, it can be a very, uh, Again, depending on the local geological conditions and uh, 
and ask how do they do redirect the folks to what. But it, it can have... Because um, if they're redirecting it to a beneficial status, you would understand that we'd have more water, if it, if the, but the impact is not there. You know, we're, we're diminishing. You know, every time we, we do a, uh, I think it's once a month we meet up on the head gate uh, to distribute the water, and it seems like it drops significantly in, in a week. You know, and, and if we have that much spring flow up, upstream, it's going somewhere. Right. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it really depends how they're using the water out there, but there are several, several ways you can redirect the spring or uh, uh, the whole river, you will, to a certain point to recharge certain conditions. So there is this technique that is called storage aquifer and recovery. It's basically a lot of times you kind of drag water from a stream or a spring to a particular geological formation to keep that water there and you can pump it out later on, right? It really depends on the geolog geological formation you're dealing with. If it's kind of like a close uh, basin, then you can retain, you can capture most of the water. Out. If it's, a, it's an open condition, you might lose most of that water. But it might end up somewhere else. But what I'm asking is, is it a benefit to, uh, let's say, the downstream a second users, or just benefit for a certain entity? Either way, like I said, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what they're doing, but it, it can be, it can be either way. It can be a benefit to the community if they do it in a certain way. It can be harmful to the community if they do it in a certain way. But without further knowledge, I don't know. What's happening up there this year is they redirect the springs. They need X amount of water, no matter how much snow melt there is or how little snow melt there is. So this year, the effect is even more dramatic because they're still drawing that same amount of water, even though hardly any snow fell last year and we had very little rain. So then the Rio Hondo is more adversely affected. Dry here, like this. Yeah, in, in that case, you're describing this. It's, it's, a, it's a bad thing. Oops. Let's, let's do this at this time. Let's let the, uh, Carlos finish the presentation. Let's, we'll take a 10 minute break after he finishes and have a little bit of questions. All right. Thanks. Yes, please. So, here's the tool that Sol was talking about. Right. Not that one yet. So, here's an example that back in the days, this is some of the data that. I would show you guys for these kind of meetings. This is these two examples. We did it for every single one, and I will bring you the data. I will be collected, or, and then we did it for the different instrumentation. We have these manual measurements to calibrate whatever was being recorded there. We have the the, the staff gauge that you guys can go and read on the side, and we were comparing to manual measurements. So we use all this data to see. Like here we noticed that it was a sensor battery reading, so we immediately detected that, that, that aspect. Uh, this is the flume capacity here. The, the Quichilla has a 40 CFS capacity, right? So you've never seen the Quichilla exceeding flow. So that's why this is a battery reading. So, that's, so the Quichilla was, at least in that time, was always under that uh, flow. So it was, it was for the most part working just fine, except for that glitch there. Uh, but that was something that we cut right away. The Atlai was also pretty pretty good. We kind of have some uh, gaps in there, but the data was pretty okay for the most part. It's within the, the 10 to 15 percent uh, difference that you normally see in hydrology. So it's so I tell you, it's a 15 percent difference in what you measure from one device versus the other. In hydrology, that's okay. In many other disciplines, that's life versus death, right? But we're talking with, with physical sciences here, but it's, it's a totally different thing. Some of the ditches, uh, like the Atalaya, will be uh, overflowing certain, certain periods of the year, particularly during the high flow conditions. And several of them did, this is just one example of them. But it wasn't like a super big deal, and we collected, I think it's a good graph, but we have some, some measurements that we need manual measurements, so we can now, this is what we're working now with this other student, to calibrate uh, 
the, the amount of water that goes past in based on the amount of, of uh, velocity, the, the velocity that we were measuring at a given time. So we are not relying only on the fluid reading, but also on what we call a calibration curve in the sensor. So we'll be able to provide you some of that for those years, what well, the data has been cleaned and things like that. So just to an example, to show you an example of what we did back in the days. This is what Solomon was talking about the data. And I'll follow up to see what, what else we can we can get for you guys. So this is the assessment and uh, I think one of the last meetings that I came here, I told you what was the condition for each of the executives based on my technical assessment of what's going on. So this is the capacity of the flumes at a given time for all the sequias. This is the maximum flow that I was getting measurements there. And by the diversion, the Cushia was fine. The Asekia the was, was fine very much. Uh, so you can see that it's under the capacity. Uh, the second San Antonio, that was a, it was a problem, at least on that day. It was really overflowing, so the flu was not enough. Mm -hmm. So it was one of my recommendation at the time was either you guys have less flow or you have a bigger flow to, to capture those things. So because once you have the seven CFS capacity, so you, you're not really measuring anything because you, you don't know what's going on there. Uh, so I mean, that doesn't mean that this is wrong, it's just what we were mentioning. And sometimes, if this happened also with the, one of the kind of cities, some of the plumes, when they were installed the first time, were very small. And they were not to the to what you guys capacity normally irrigate. So that's, that's an under design issue, it's not that you guys were managing the water wrong or different, it's just uh, the design of the, of the plume. Kind uh, of north, this is the one. Remember when we, this was a three, three and a half CFS, and we observed it and we said, okay, let's change it, and we changed it to a seven CFS, and it were just fine for all this time that we that we were measuring there. I don't know what happened after I left, but uh, but at the time it was just just fine. It says that we replaced that flume. The kind of the south, it was more or less okay, but it was it's a lot of seepage going on there. That's the the, the natural nature of the ditch. The there's not much water that you can run there to max 3.8 CFS regardless, so it's not so much the flume capacity, it's just the ditch that is small. It's mostly about the seepage coming out of it and the ditch, but it's one of those things I was telling you about soils and geologists, unless you put a pipe straight to it, I mean, what else are you gonna do with those kind of ditches? So you gotta live with those, with those things. Uh, the, the channel was working just fine, except we had a relief channel, that was a big deal. So at some point, the flume was capturing very good information, but you guys had to curve a channel on the side, and that was water that was not accounted for to the flume. So I don't know, that was something we noticed back then. And Atalaya, like I said, it was working fine, pretty much. You can see the max flow is pretty much in alignment with it. That's all the point, just very, very brief of time. Same thing with the plaza, well, it was okay. So, based on this assessment that I did back then, of course, I don't know how things have changed then and now, uh, most of the films were, were used fine, and the way you guys were handling your water, it was, at least from the measurement perspective, it was, it was, it was okay. Now, the way you guys allocate this to you, the water, the, that's, that's a different, different game. Huh? But in terms of the capacity of the instrumentation, and the flows that we had there, it was just, it was, it was okay. A little bit under capacity to my taste, but it wasn't like a big deal. Yes. So that was done in a time of big flow, where there was a lot of water? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was, yeah, the thing with that San Antonio, yeah, that's the high flow conditions. And, and you can see, that's, that was, an, an, and it's also like, a, yeah, I think you guys can solve that, we just having a, a slightly bigger flow because you have a pretty good ditch right there, and the location is pretty good. So it's almost like, so for the most part, one of the things we do is, and these flumes are designed to create what we call the critical flow, so you can measure. These are uh, ramp, ramp type flow. If you have noticed, at the bottom of that, it has like a little ramp. So that ramp, what it does is kind of 
the water is coming here and it kind of creates use the, the critical condition it has a hole right there where you can measure the water at a critical point that means at the highest point so you can measure it more accurately that's what's called the critical point so as long as the the, the ramp flumes like the ones you have here they can be the size of the ditch that is fine some more types of flume they have to be more constrained but in this case you can go with the size of the flume and this, this is what we did kind of times it was north it's, it's not exactly to the size of the ditch but it's very close to it um, if you have two of those ramp flumes of the same size but they're on different ditches and the water going into them is going in at, at different velocities will, they, will both ones read accurately or uh, does it depend on the velocity of the water yes uh, that's, that's a good question the, if you install the plume correctly so the plumes are required to have what we call an approach that means an x distance between the mouth of the plume to where you have about less than two percent slope uh, and typically is ten times the width of the flume so that means you have a flume that is a foot wide so you need to have at least a ten feet approach that is is a gentle slope so the idea is to kind of for the water velocity to stabilize you have a dish like this like that it's pretty steep it's going to be after velocity right so then that's not right because it's not ready correctly or you have a flume like that that's a problem too so but something you need to keep an eye on you and my ordomos just need to kind of kind of keep it keep the level as much as you can for the for the 10 times approach so in order for the flume to read accurately you need a two percent slope for 10 times the width approaching the flume the two of them ten yeah for two ten yeah for for two tenths of the approach at a less than two percent slope two tenths two times oh, ten, two, two, uh, two times, times the width ten times the width of the of the flume that is the distance of your approach right minimum and then with a with a less or equal to two percent slope okay right and so if it's going slightly uphill to the flume that's not going to be accurate that's not accurate because you are slowing the velocity and the flumes have these pre-calibrated equations now one of the things we were doing without that data so also you can develop your own equations to adjust for those things if your flume is slightly up or down uh -huh. so okay. those equations doesn't have to rely only on the manufacturer pre-calibrated conditions you could calibrate it by moving the staff yeah i would rely on the staff gauge i would rely more on the manual measurements and, and then develop your own equation and, and then uh then yes you can adopt this the staff gauge once you know but it's, it's not as an easy task yes i think what he's referring to uh who had that problem we've seen it in the prando beat mm -hmm. it uh goes and it measures a 0.5 but the water never runs down it stays like it's leaving when it comes back and about how it's in and so i never get water moving yeah that's back flow that's not back flow. that's not what it's supposed to do and then um so if it's more than a two percent slope that's also going to be inaccurate right yes yeah it's, it's not like super bad if it's you know between zero and two percent but it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's not like if it's 4%, then, then you have a problem. I would say of all the flumes on the river, on the different ditches, the Kuchia, the water as it approaches the flume is going very fast. Um, and then on the Brandos, for example, it's going very slow. It's actually going uphill. But I would say on the Kuchia, it's possibly well, those are the sort of things that doesn't, I mean, are, are relatively easy to fix. You just need to, to know how to do it. And um, like I said, I can talk to this guy from Manhattan's UC, and they, they can uh, send some of this guy some requires you sort of a, a level and some initial measurement to help you guys see what you guys need to do. If it's something that you guys need to level on your own, well, that's an extra part of the work. But at least to know what is the thing that you need to do is, is rather amazing. 
I mean, I wish I had more time to help you with those things around here, but now there's not this trick, so. Thanks for that really useful information. Good. All right, so next, please. Um, oh, and here's, uh, this is, don't even bother about this data, this is just to illustrate that this is an, the ongoing analysis that I was telling you for, I think this is 2015, so all these years. One, two, three, four, five years. Uh, Jose Juan Cruz is working on this uh, river and for each of the acequias analysis, what is the relationship on, based on the flow. So all these data has already been cleaned to some extent. So this is the data that I think once they are done with this information, uh, I can ask them and they can send it to you guys. I think this goes up to 2015 for what I recall. As that, like I said, I'm, I don't know, I, you mentioned that Alejandro has taken a couple of ditch measurements. Did you join in the yeah. of the but this is something I can, can try and work with to send it this info. Okay. So, uh, the other thing is in terms of the, the recharge, this is a paper by uh, Karina Gutierrez. She did this irrigation experiment there in Valdez where we, uh, or she, uh, documented the amount of water from different flumes and, and the wells that, and we have a weather station here how much water was supplied and how much of that water was recharged in the aquifer how fast what was the response of the aquifer remember so this is a very important thing for connecting to the stream and this is some of our findings this is the well so each of these is the amount of water uh, in millimeters that was applied in each irrigation. This is what passes below the 0.6 meter, what we call root zone. That means when the, wa the plants are not taking uh, water anymore, and it recharges the aquifer. So all these pipes is to water reaching the aquifer. So that tells you that it's a very active system. Basically, every time you apply water, some of that was used by the plants, and the rest was used kind of helping recharging the aquifer. You can see the entire season here. They, 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 they shut the ditch, and you can see the, the groundwater level just dropping, and then they turn the ditch on again, and they kind of went back again with some of the irrigations. So irrigation is a big deal to keep, to maintain the aquifer, the local aquifer recharge, and this for your domestic wells or for any other things that you need, and for connecting with the, with the stream as well. Some of the wells data, uh, thanks for to some uh, all of you that helped us with this some, some of this data collection. Uh, still need to follow up with the same issue with the data. Some of the data I collected back then, I was representing for two wells, one in, in the Valdez area and one in, uh, in Arroyo Hondo, to see how they behave sorry, during the season. But basically, it's just a, so your domestic wells, you guys were kind of not uh, kind. To, to help us put a centering in the well, we mentioned the water table fluctuations. So the one in Valdez, what is in the blue lines, the, the blue lines is the irrigation season from April to uh, September, kind of end of September, uh, for 2010 and for 2011, for two, two years. So during the irrigation season, as expected, you put a lot of water out there. So your aquifer recharges, and it kind of maintains that, that storage condition. Uh, same thing in, this, in the second season. What is very important and very critical here is what this delayed return flow, right here. So in this case, it seems like it was a little more water in the river, and then you have another response there of irrigation season. But the rest is just water returning back so all this is kind of your, your savings account for your water. Because yeah. you put all the water there to the system and it's coming back to the stream later on. This is the return flow. As the irrigation space flow conditions very similar to the previous year, you turn the irrigation on again and you start doing the same thing. And the expectation is, uh, once I, I take a close look at the data, it's gonna do the same thing every year. This is what we observed on the other side. It's pretty, pretty much the same. So seasonal groundwater recharge, this is for Valdez. Arroyo Hondo, similar things, basically the same thing, even the same thing there for the, when the river got more water. So basically you have the same recharge, 
Uh, so if you remember in 2011, you guys have less water there, so it was less recharged there. And this is a consequence of how much water you have to allocate to the fields. So your recharge is less. But nonetheless, you have some direct response to the irrigation. So again, some of the things you already know from practical experience, but here's some data to validate or back up some of that. What is the average depth of the well that you're using this data from? Uh, it varies. Well, like in this case, you can see we start the base flow at uh, 34 feet below the ground level. The previous one, can you go back to the one? Yeah, this one is a pretty, so it's pretty, pretty similar. These are the ones down of the of the of the valley. Then we, I don't have the data, but we were measuring ones in um, the small this area that are much deeper than that. I don't remember the depth. For it. But it was sort of a similar response to our. Yes. Have, could you could you hold the questions? No, I want to ask right now because I don't remember it. Okay. I'm not saying you forget about the questions. Yes, thank you. Let it finish. Uh -huh. I've noticed that over the years, the Rio Hondo, the stream right in the Royal Hondo itself, the river, there's no water in it. Dries completely. Segments of that river. It's just you see rock and that's it. And then it picks up water only because it comes from the meadows. And that's when you get your water back into and the, uh, the um, other segments of the river that then flows on all the way down to the Rio Grande. Mm -hmm. So that would have an impact, definitely, when that river, those river segments are dry, would have a, uh, definitely, I would think, would have uh, an impact on the recharge. Uh, and, and, and that's worrisome. And that will happen generally, uh, especially like in this instance this year, there are segments of the river that are have been completely dry. And of course that happens when the water is distributed among the ditches. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and of course that that's kind of a leads to the question that I had before, because you just indicated that as long as the land is being irrigated or there is water in the ditches, the ditches will have an impact on the, re on the recharge. But if some of those ditches are not getting any water, then the recharge is not going to be there. Yeah. You can see it in the You can see this is what a drier year, less and less water put out in the fields, less recharge. A year like this, I could anticipate it's probably going to be even more than this. Right, so, yeah, they also the right. The meadows thing that you're mentioning, that's exactly what I'm referring to as the perch water systems. That's an indication of a, of a, of a perch water system and meadows and spring, basically. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next. So, finally, we got to the conclusions, and I think we're already discussing, discussing all. Uh, very rapid exchange with the acequias and the crop fields and the river itself and the shallow aquifer, things that we were just talking about. So this is this is a, a good thing for the system that you're dealing with. The downside of that is that if you don't have water to irrigate or you, or you all the sun and start going from the traditional irrigation to a more modern application of pesticides and things like that, then these systems are very fragile because they have very shallow systems very shallow aquifers and you can get any pollutants in no time at all into, into the, the aquifer and that's a big, big problem. So it's because of these conditions of highly permeable soils and uh, the rapid transport and the, the geology as we discussed is a critical portion. It's even more critical than in the alcalde system that we had studied before. Nonetheless, I'm pleasantly surprised from the research side point of view that it, the, the, the findings are pretty similar to what we see in other Asequia systems that are different geology and, and different, the, the, the only thing that is, or not the only thing, but one of the main things that is the same is the Asequias as enhancers and expanders of water redistribution for the flow plain. So that in itself is a, good, a great message that you guys can take to whoever, that your Asequia systems are acting to enhance the floodplain in the riparian uh, condition. So increasing the habitat, increasing hydrology, and improving water quality, all those things. So all those are environmental flows and, and protections that you can get from these systems. Again, the caveat is 
you turn into a more kind of pollutant type of system, then, then you're going to have consequences back. And I mentioned thinking of the spring, something that needs to be studied in more detail. And this thing about whoever has discussed that thing with the development, right? With the scheme. These two things, to me, are the things if you work to keep studying these things, you need to pay special attention to these two, two aspects. I mean, and we're still doing some of the work that, we, that we've been doing, but go beyond that and incorporate some of this, this information there. And with that, last of this, I want to thank you all, particularly those of you that help us uh, by allowing us to do the measurements of your properties, access to, to the valleys, your wells, and uh, very thankful, and uh, anything I can do to help, please let me know.